Welcome back, everybody. Uh, today's special guest on the Zoomcast is Carsten Horn, uh, CEO of Reho Travel. Uh, Carsten's been in the industry and, and with Reho Travel for, for a number of years, and I'm sure plenty of people have heard the name or, or know Carsten really well. But, uh, you know, for those out there that don't, um, Carsten, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of a bit of your backstory, a bit of bit of the journey as to how Reho came about, um, you know, and, and also you know what Reho is about as a business and, and what you what you guys do and, and sort of your your purpose and and you know how you guys operate in, in a slightly you know different way to, to possibly um, you know some of the other parts of the industry. If you could put all that in into one go, that would be that would be great. I'll have a crack. Uh, <laughs> Thank, thank you, Josh. And uh, yeah, so it all started for me when I was eight years old. Um, lived in suburban Melbourne. Dad came home one day and said, um, your grandmother in Germany is quite ill and uh, we need to get there. And we're like, okay, cool. It's exciting. Uh, go back to Germany where I was born. And um, Dad said, the problem is uh, we can't afford the airfares, so we're going to build a boat. And over the following few months, uh, we built a large, quite a large boat inside our lounge room. Uh, it was basically a rubber dinghy uh, with a sail and a cabin. And uh, then we took my coach up to Rockhampton and attempted uh, to go from Rockhampton to uh, Germany in this rubber dinghy. Uh, for those with a reasonable understanding of geography in Australia, we got as far as Yapoon. Uh, which is about 30 or 40 kilometres for Rockhampton. Eventually, uh, we made the front page of uh, all the national newspapers. Um, we're, on, we're on television. There was search and rescue. They couldn't find us. The trip was abandoned. And then for the next um, two years, we, or two, nearly three years, we basically hitchhiked, travelled overland from Australia through to um, Germany and back again. And one of the interesting parts of the story is that we arrived in Germany the day before, sorry, the day after my grandmother died. So um, it was a bit of a futile trip. And I've actually got a, a young director has written a script and uh, there's a movie being made about the journey, uh, which hopefully will come out in the uh, next few years. So that's a little bit of background, I guess, what, how I ended up in the travel industry. Um, how I made the decision to join the travel industry. When I was 17, my parents bought me a one-way ticket to Lima in Peru. And then I backpacked for six months around Peru. Um, I was in Bogota for quite a while. Bogota was a, quite an interesting place in the 80s. And I was there during the Falklands War. So there was quite a bit of tension in uh, South America at the time. And I spent a day in the Pan Am office um, trying to change my flight. Uh, back home and I watched watched how they worked um, they took they took phone calls people came in people wanted to travel they worked out the connections and paid them money and they went home and I thought it's a really easy job because by then I remember when I was um, about 12 I could name nearly every country in the world and I had this competition with my brother um, where we named I think i I was like 280 airlines uh, that, I, that I could name. So I, I looked at the job and I thought, that's easy. And um, eventually, a couple of years later, I, um, my very first job interview, um, I got the job as a travel consultant. And that was about 35 years ago. Um, roll on joining Reho about, you know, I can't even remember, probably 29, 30, 30 years ago. And it's a little bit like that Gillette story. You know, I like the business so much, I bought the company. And uh, now I've been the sole owner of Reho for over a decade now. And one of, one of the key differences, I guess, from Reho to other businesses, the change happened about 10 years ago. We chartered a truck uh, with the family and drove from Nairobi to Cape Town. And on January the 1st, we're in a small town called Mizuzu in Malawi. And I met this young guy who sold postcards on the side of the road and he'd sell the postcards for a dollar 
and he'd sell four or five postcards a week because not many trucks came through Malawi. It's not like it's Tanzania or, uh, or Kenya, one of the more popular countries. And uh, we, we got chatting to him and, you know, he told me that he kept calling me an old man. And um, this was, this was quite, a, quite a while ago. And um, we discovered that the, the, age, uh, the average age when most people uh, die in Malawi is about 34. And um, we learned that his father had died at, at a similar age and he was, he was there selling postcards to keep the family going. Um, we then exchanged Yahoo addresses. This was uh, when everyone had a Yahoo address back in those days. And then we corresponded over a few months. And in the end, I came up with the idea of, instead of him sitting by the side of, side of the road selling his postcards, he would draw us Christmas cards. And so we came up with the deal where he'd draw us 500 Christmas cards. I'd pay him half the money in advance, half on delivery. He'd get off the side of the road and start going to school. And that eventually um, turned into um, him going to school, becoming a, eventually became a teacher. And then we set up a microfinance uh, bank um, in, in Malawi um, together, which we ran for uh, about five years. And then eventually our business became, a, became one of the first B Corps in uh, Australia, which was five years ago. And B Corps com companies that um, do equally good for business and good for the world. And we had a presentation um, from a client of mine who was telling me about B Corp. I was sitting in the back of the room. They were telling me all about the principles of it, about you know, how it's good for the socially, good for the environment, good for the community. And they talked about all the things that businesses need to do to become a B Corp. And I just went, you mean there's a stamp for the things we do, the things that we naturally do as a business? And so the next day I, I did the B Corp assessment, you need a minimum of 80 points. And we got 128 points without changing any elements of our business. Uh, wow. Eventually that got audited down, but uh, we still easily passed. And since then we've been um, re reassessed three times and the, it gets harder and harder and harder to um, reach the, the threshold because they're becoming a lot stricter. But, uh, so that's a, that's a quick wrap up about um, some of the principles, principles of our business and I guess where the thinking came from. So I think for me, my, the very first country I went to when I left Australia was um, Portuguese Timor. And, uh, you know, our family walked the length of Portuguese Timor. You might have heard of the movie uh, Malibu. We walked from Dili to Palabo. And... Uh, when we're walking through the jungles, uh, we're the first white family uh, most of the people have seen there. So my first, my first impression as an eight-year-old for a country outside Australia, um, the normal was, um, you know, I guess, the jungles of Timor. So when, when I was in a position to, I guess, run, run a business and start giving back, it, it seemed an obvious, I guess, an obvious thing to do. And what about... Um the travel business itself, um, you know, where are you guys based? You know, how many, how many people you have working for you and what are you predominantly, uh, what's your predominantly operations or what are you predominantly selling? Yep. So the, um, the business itself, Reho started off as um, a bucket shop, uh, which are well, well known in uh, London. It was uh, all based on, uh, I guess, cheap fares to Australia. Then we evolved into a mixture of corporate and leisure. And now we have, um, we do a mixture of corporate leisure and study tours. Um, we have 25 staff, 30% um, of our business is study tours. So we do about 120 study tours um, around the world for uh, majority or the, a lot of the key universities um, in Melbourne. And we also do study tours for other, other organisations. We have a small leisure division and then the majority of our business is um, corporate. And how's, uh, how's business going for you guys at the moment? How have you fared through all of this? You know, what's the current state of play and what are you, you know, what are you doing as far as sort of staffing, job keeper, um, you know, the operation side of things, what does that look like? Yeah, it's pretty tough. Uh, the first, I guess the first part of the business to fall over was study tours. Uh, early on in, in March, uh, 
there was the indicator that, okay, the universities are not going to be confident, confident in sending their students on study tours. And we thought, okay, okay well, if that's, if that's the worst of it, uh, we can handle that. But then, uh, you know, it all changed within a couple of weeks. So we're, we're down 99.5% in revenue. Um, last month, we tipped over 100 as a few uh, refunds kicked in. Uh, so it's been a really interesting challenge, uh, I guess, for my wife and I as directors to run a business without revenue. That's something that they don't teach you at business school. And so it has been a challenge. We've, we stood down the majority of our team just before JobKeeper, and then, uh, but they're, they're now all back and they're, they're working on JobKeeper. And there's, we've mainly been working on process improvements, um, training. Um, we've probably got about 50, 60 training sessions um, scheduled. Um, I think everyone now knows how to use Excel and PowerPoint. Um, plenty of mindfulness, um, all that sort of thing, Tramata, tips and tricks and um, product and uh, self personal development, that sort of thing. So there's been a lot of time doing, doing that. We have uh, you know, drinks on Friday nights, virtual drinks, and we have uh, week, weekly meetings. And then we've got a core team that are working on process improvements and uh, you know, innovations. And we're currently looking at, assuming the New Zealand bubble comes up, we're looking at uh, pivoting our study tours to New Zealand. So we're doing a lot of research on what existing tours that were all over the world, how they actually could be done in New Zealand because we feel study tours could take a couple of years to come back because the universities have been hit really hard with the international students. And uh, so it has been, it has been a, a real, real challenge, yeah. And we've obviously seen plenty of media, um, you know, the last couple of months of, of some of the, I guess, bad news stories or, or some of the challenges that face the industry um, across the board. Have you guys got some some good news stuff that you can share with us that, you know, maybe in those first few weeks or, or first first month or so, you know, where we, you know, we, we can highlight some of those great things that your, your agents were doing for your customers out there. And, um, you know, I guess we're just trying to get as much of that um, to the to the to the surface as possible. Um, you know, have you got any specific things that you guys know that you did really really well over that period that that um, perhaps hasn't been you know highlighted as much? Yeah, we um, we've been really lucky. We haven't had a single client, um, although we've had a lot you know, trying to get refunds, not getting any refunds, all that sort of stuff. We haven't had a single client. Um, we haven't had any of that abuse um, that we're hearing around around the industry. Our, our clients have all been incredibly understanding. Um, one of the major universities were having a lot of trouble. Um, we mainly do study tours for the universities, so not individual travel, but they were having a lot of trouble getting students back to their home countries. So over a weekend, we set up a, a quick division called um, Student Repatriation Services and it gave an opportunity for a few thousand students to contact us and um, we went out of our way to get those students back to their home countries and um, the numbers weren't in you know it wasn't in the hundreds but uh, definitely a few dozen students that um, didn't think they could get back but we worked really hard to get them back with the support of the university so so that was great but yeah overall it's been um yeah it there hasn't been really anything negative from the customer point of view. Uh, we've been, I've been working on a series of videos to keep things fun and positive um, to share, not only amongst the industry, but uh, amongst our clients base, client base, both so they can see a little bit more inside, you know, I guess the people behind the business. Uh, there was the first one I gave them the tour of our house. Um, we, we changed our brand as an April Fool's joke um, to rehome with the tagline, just like you, we're not going anywhere. And um, it was supposed to be an April Fool's joke, but the feedback we had from clients was so positive, we actually registered the name. And so we've been operating the business as rehome, just like you, we're not going anywhere. And uh, then we created a, um, a video which has gone viral 
um, based on um, 20 friends in 20 countries who are all um, saying, just like you, we're not going anywhere. Uh, many of them are tour guides, so they're, they're all out of work at the moment. And um, so, yeah, the video series has been really popular. And I guess it's kept, it's kept people excited about, about traveling and, uh, and it gives our consultants something to share so they can write to their clients and go, hey, how are things going? Oh, by the way, boss just created this video. You might like to check it out. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, we've, we've just been sort of keeping the vibe. A bit of pressure on me now because uh, the expectation is that I'm going to produce something really good. And... Um, Initially, it was fun because I didn't know how to edit. I just thought, I thought I'll, I'll try and learn how to edit, just you know, educate myself a little bit. And uh, yeah, the standard keeps uh, going up and the expectation goes up. So that's probably the one. Yeah, you ask about what have you been doing in isolation. Um, my team have been working part-time, but my wife and I have been working five days a week, uh, eight hours a day. This video project, everyone goes, oh, you just got time on your hands, you know, nice work. And uh, guess what? They're all nighters. Uh, yep. They're late at night, early up on a Sunday morning. Uh, yeah, so it hasn't really interfered with the day to day because we, we are really busy. Um, yeah. Work, working on projects and things. Yeah. I, can, I can attest to that, you know, even just doing these, um, you know, 30, 40 minute, you know, interview. I don't edit any of them. Um, but just loading them up and, and putting the content and, and all of those things, it, it takes time. Um, yeah. So I, I absolutely get it. Look, I'm curious to, to, to hear your thoughts around why, you know, obviously you've done some a lot of good work in, in creating really great engagement and connection with your customers at the moment, the videos and so forth. But surely the reason why you have had such good, um, I guess, feedback and, and not, not had that... Um, you know, the, the abuse or, you know, those aggressive customers or those quite challenging conversations as, as maybe some others out there have been. What do you, what would you put that down to that, you know, it's such a large business that you run that you can, you know, um, go through something like this um, and not really have um, a lot of that, you know, those challenges that maybe a lot of the other industry has seen? I think there's a couple, there's a couple of things one would be our team. So 30% of our team have been with us for 10 years. So they've, they've got a really strong relationship with their clients. And both as individuals and as the brand, I think we've, we've really focused on trust as being one of the key principles. And um, so, yeah, being very, very open and honest with our clients over not just during this period, but... Uh, over, over, I guess, the last 10, 15, 20 years, they, now we get to a crisis, they know that what we're saying is correct. You know, they, they trust that, you know, we're not trying to rip them off. Um, and they're really supportive. Um, we, had, we had one booking, it was about a $70,000 cruise. And you imagine the commission recall on that one. And... The consultant wrote to the client, explained the whole thing, and um, the client said, oh, how much commission would you have made? And she, she opened, you know, even gave her the screen print from Tramada. And the client said, well, you can charge, you can charge me that as a cancellation fee. So you can imagine, you know, that was probably like 10 grand or something like that. So uh, that was a really good news story. And I'd like, to, I'd like that to have happened with every booking, but... Um, I, yeah, to me, I'd say it's the trust we've built up in our brand over, over you know, quite, quite a number of times. And one of the advantages, I guess, of being a B Corp is it does actually develop trust because if people look at B Corps, not just our, our business, but other B Corps, you know, so let's say a, a brand like Patagonia, you already, there's this assumption that the product you buy has been made ethically. Um, you know that you know the the environment's been considered, the community's been considered, all of all of those factors. So you just go into that shop. You might pay a little little bit of a higher price for the product, but it just makes the whole process a lot a lot smoother, I guess. And, mm -hmm. and I guess yeah, less explaining because they go, well, if you've achieved a big B Corp status, you must be doing a lot of things right. Yeah, and I guess. 
on that moving forward, you know, we, we've, we've had lots of discussions on these, um, these chats with people around um, transparency and trust and, and, you know, honesty and all of those things. Um, but also we've, we've discussed a lot around that, you know, the, the conscientious side of travel and, and understanding that by not traveling, you know, the, the dolphins came back to the canals in Venice and, and the Himalayas became open to some of those Indian cities and, you know, all, all of those things that we've seen all over, um, you know, the social medias and so forth. Um, we, we all feel, and I feel personally, that people are going to be very conscious about their decision making, um, you know, to, to want to get back out there and travel again and understanding their foot, footprint and, and what, it, what it does mean to the world for them to, you know, participate in their, in their passion and their hobby of, of exploring the world. Um, how much do you think that things like B Corp and, and that, that, that type of, I guess, value or values, um, you know, are needed to make sure that, um, you know, we're providing, you know, the, the confidence with our customers that they are dealing with people that, are, that have that same, same mindset or same, um, same value towards, towards how we treat the earth moving forward. I think the level of um, consciousness in the last few, few months um, is, is going to make a difference. Like people are starting to understand a, a little bit more, even the, uh, you know, the simple one of that incredible image of being able to see the Himalayas um, from Kathmandu. I, that's unheard of. I was there a couple of, actually four years ago, exactly today. I'm up on Facebook and uh, I cannot even imagine that you could, you could see, you couldn't see the, you couldn't see Kathmandu. We were, we were mountain biking, you know, 10 kilometers out of Kathmandu. Couldn't see Kathmandu from the smog. So um, yeah, that's, it's pretty incredible. I think certainly people are going to start traveling in much smaller numbers and that will be both from the sustainability side of you and potentially from the health side of you too. You know, they're like, well, maybe a little bit uncomfortable with getting on a coach with 40 people or on a cruise ship with a few hundred people. Um, so I think we're certainly going to see people traveling in smaller numbers. Currently working on a video project where I've asked friends in 20 countries to highlight something special to them. So it could be a business that's making a difference, um, that's um, purpose-driven, making doing something in the community, or a a place of beauty that no one's ever heard of. And uh, the, the entries are just starting to, to come in. And um, one lady is a tour guide in the Pantanal in Brazil. Um, I've traveled a lot, been to nearly every country in South America, haven't been to the Pantanal, didn't know a lot about it. And I'm just looking at these, just 30 seconds of incredible images of jaguars um, in, the, in the wetlands, it just looks fascinating. So I thought if, if part of what we can do in this video is to spread, to spread the load a little bit. And in the, um, what I've said to the people involved in the video, don't send me an Eiffel Tower, don't send me a Lenny Carrow you know, I want, I want somewhere that is, is a little bit off the beaten track that people haven't heard of. So I think we, if we can spread, avoid over tourism and get people to, you know, I think you, know, you hear of B grade airports or B grade destinations or C grade, um, that's, that's what I think we need to start doing is uh, not all be going to the same places at the same time. Yeah. And I think you're right with that, you know, the, the, even just the, the, the gut feel, I think for a lot of people of, um, you know, crowds or, or, you know, the over tourism or just wherever they want to be, I guess that maybe they just want to be outside or, you know, in open air spaces and, um, you know, just for that confident side of things to get moving again. Um, you know, so I guess if we can, you know, as, as an industry, you know, be able to educate customers and educate, you know, um, people in, in what it is that they're, they're going to, what, how they're contributing to, to the sustainability of the environment that they're going to, or, you know, or avoiding certain places, which is actually contributing to, you know, the same thing, um, that will help, help gain more confidence and get people, you know, more confident to move again, I guess. I had an um, example last year, I climbed Mount Ararat in Turkey, which is a 5,000 metre mountain. There was, uh, when I got to the top, um, there was about six of us on that day who climbed that mountain, who stand on the top. Um, incredible views, you can see, see into five countries. Uh, a year earlier, 
around the same time, uh, me and 450 of my buddies summited at Mount Kilimanjaro on the same day. And you, you have about 30 seconds at the top to take your photo without hundreds of people in it. It's like next, next, next. And um, so it's just an example, you know, where this, this whole bucket list thing, I find it particularly frustrating. I, I was a victim of it. I went, yeah, I want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. There's two or three other mountains in uh, Africa that are just as spectacular and uh, probably a tenth of the amount of people are climbing them um, every, every year. So yeah, there's, um, I think, yeah, we certainly need to spread, spread it out a little bit and uh, not all be going to the same place because we'll, we'll ruin those places. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what, what have you found the most frustrating part of the, the last few months, you know, from an industry, industry perspective and, um, you know, things that you think because you found them frustrating would also be really good if we could start working on, you know, a bit of a reset button or, or starting to fix those, those areas of the industry and, and you know, things that make it hard and, and challenging, especially through these, um, you know, these challenging times. Yeah, I guess um, making money is in this industry is, is always a challenge and obviously it's been a massive challenge right now but i think the way service fees are structured there, there needs to be something we need to change that um especially in the corporate space at the moment we're doing it's taking three or four hours to make a domestic booking um you know to go from melbourne to um let's say darwin you might have to go via perth and another point in WA to get there and you might have to overnight twice and then the hire car companies close when you get there and then the hotel is used, being used for quarantine and on it goes like that um, and then you end up making 15 to 20 dollars on it so that that's particularly frustrating right now so we've got two or three staff working on something like 10 20 bookings a week um, but it does highlight that when it when it does come back the the amount of work we're doing um, isn't really equal to the, the revenue. Um, we have to invest in so much technology to make corporate travel worthwhile. Um, so that's difficulty. So I think um, for the industry to survive, we've got to be really good at um, promoting the value we add. I think, uh, yeah, that's the key. And also um, we need the consumer to understand that we represent them so in the in the retail or corporate travel space, we're actually representing the computer con, consumer, <laughs> um, not the supplier. Um, I think we're all put in one side of the side of the airlines and the suppliers and the hotels, but no, we're actually we should be on the we're on the customer side. We're we're one of them, and we're there where they're representing them, working for them, to link them up with the end product. We generally see we seem to be mixed up with the end product, and if we can really stand out in that space and say, "No, we're here to look after the consumer," um, then hopefully we'll in, you know get more credibility. Think of a company like Choice. Something like Choice is seen as they've positioned themselves as they're there to um, yeah. You want to buy a product, you go to Choice, you read all the ratings, and then you move on from there. You know, maybe the travel agents could be more, more, more in that space to, a, to a assist the computer, be, be the experts um, in, in between. So to me, I think that's, that's what the future could look like. So I guess kind of like, a, um, we're not TripAdvisor, we don't necessarily want to promote promoting that side of things, but, you know, more like an aggregator type, um, you know, yeah, being, being, that, being that person that, that deciphers the, um, the noise um, clearly for, for a customer to, to make the right decision. Yeah. And I think the, our experience, especially in traveling, right, most travel consultants have, have been to a lot of these places. Um, as people are traveling in smaller numbers and going to different places, the, there's going to be less, sure, sure there's heaps, heaps of stuff online, but you know, what's real news, what's fake news, what's credible, but to sit down in front of someone who has been to this small island that you catch this ferry, do this and do that, and actually say, yeah, when you get there, it is really cool, as against what the website says. Um, 
that's, that's going to be a huge value because less and less people would have been to those particular places. So that, that knowledge, the stuff you can only find through actually traveling has become going to become more and more important. But we need to convince the consumer that that's sort of, that is important. Yeah. And, and, I, that's going to match. and I guess that kind of works from both sides is, is making sure that, you know, the, the, the suppliers and the, and the destination tourism bodies and so forth really see the value of, of travel agents, um, you know, and, and what the, how they can actually promote the product. And, and you know, we, we talked about this with the agent of influence guys the other day, you know, really seeing that, you know, that, that expertise coming from firsthand experience as, as a really key um, factor to be able to, to have those great, honest, transparent conversations with customers about what they're actually going to experience when they get there um, and what it's like to be there and, and what it's like to, to, to walk through the markets and, and how to do certain things um, to be able to match that customer with that, that agent that's been able to experience that. But at the same time, giving agents as many opportunities as possible to, to get that firsthand experience, um, I think is, is really key. Um, and, and seeing the benefit of, a benefit of what that can provide for a, for a supplier um, to invest a little bit of, of that um, you know, marketing spend um, on an actual physical person who can actually then tell the story and share that story um, with their customers, with their database. And I think the key, our, if you look at the Rego website, there's about 120 stories on there. Um, most of them, there's a lot of good ones, most of them pretty average. Uh, traditional consultant goes on education, goes on a holiday, writes up 1500 words, takes a few photos in the iPhone, you upload it, and there it is on the website. Um, and I guess agents and influence is a good segue to that because it's going to be more and more important. If, you, if you're something that's sent on an educational now, they've got the, the supplier needs to get a return on investment. So we all need to be much more skilled in taking photos and telling the story. Because um, if we're going to be, they don't, they won't have the budgets in the future or they'll have the choice, they'll have a choice to put the budget into sending a film crew over there. Or why not send a whole bunch of travel agents who can make their own content? Uh, the consumer is more open to honest, maybe not incredibly high quality content that they've, you know, they might have got from uh, Getaway or say Hello World TV or something like that in the past. But uh, yeah, the future, a whole lot of travel agents make their own content and put it up on the website and share it. So you know, maybe there, that could be, it's a good way to reduce the costs and also expand the knowledge of the consultants. Yeah, you, you can't book a holiday with Katrina Rantry. No, no, that's right. <laughs> you know, and as much as, you know, it's great to see those shows and, and it, that's been, I guess, the, the common way for a lot of people to get their inspiration, um, you know, of, of where to travel to and what to do. Um, but if we can you know, marry this up a little bit more and, and start to see the value of the agent, but at the same time, agents also see the value in, in what that, you know, investing in themselves, investing their own time and energy and, and actually going and experiencing these products as well. Because, you know, I, I've been on the other side as well, you know, of, um, you know, trying to liaise suppliers with agents and, and getting agents to, to, to want to commit to certain educational or certain trips, um, you know, and there may be a participation fee or, or there may have been something that's, um, that was holding them back, but, you know, there'll be plenty of um, product managers out there that will tell you sometimes it is challenging to fill, um, you know, fill those gaps and fill those spaces. So, you know, I think as a collective, you know, if we can all see see what that that value can bring from a supplier point of view and for those career travel agents that really understand that investing in their own travel and their own experience and, and possibly, you know, maybe doing types of travel that may not necessarily be what they they love to do, um, but really seeing the benefit that, you know, is going to bring to, to their business and, and to themselves moving forward. Yeah, I think the, um, I'd like to see the end of the, the mills that are basically cocktails, palm trees, you know, um, it's all about the thread count of the sheet, you know, in the five-star hotel, all of that sort of stuff. I'd like to see a lot more for mills where they're making a difference on the, on the ground. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there, there's an educational value in, um, in what they're doing as well. So really spending a little bit more time in places. Um, I've only been on a couple of mills, you know, believe it or not, in 30 years. I've never really been interested. I'd rather choose where I, where I travel to. But uh, those that I have, 
I think of the trips and I can hardly even remember where I was. It's like, oh, that's what we got on there and we went to this thing and did that and did that. And yeah, so I think to have for mills that are, yeah, more time in, in um, out, of, out of the way places and a focus on creating some content. I think, yeah, I think that that's key and the content is key and, and I think one thing I always noticed, it just came to my head just then when you were talking about it was when you do go on a familiar with a bunch of experienced travel agents, everyone all of a sudden forgets how to travel really, really quickly. And you know, it's, it's like, where, where do I buy water? What time's breakfast? How do I do this? And how do I do this? And you can be walking around with people that are 60, 70, 80 countries deep, you know, been in the game for 30 years. And all of a sudden, because somebody is going to hold your hand, and the red carpet gets rolled out as you enter into the country or, or into the resort or, or whatever. And, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, don't you know who I am where these agents, you know, please, please wait on me hand and foot so that I sell your product. You know, even, even that concept, I think as well, you know, to really allow people to immerse themselves in the destination and really get to understand what, what it is that they're saying and, and what it is that they're going to then, you know, share, share that story with their customers you know, I think a self-familiar, um, you know, concept um, or a, a smaller group that's not even hosted, um, you know, may may find that that, that experience um, be, becomes a little bit more highlighted. And, and as you said, you don't come back and go, what did I do here? Where was I here? Because really you're just moving from restaurant to hotel to restaurant to cocktail party and then maybe take a few photos of some sites and then come home. Um, that's, that's not how your customers are going to experience that trip. So why are we... Why are we getting our travel agents to experience it that way um, because they'll come home and, and, and you can't articulate that to a, to a customer because they're not going to have that experience necessarily. I think an amazing race type concept would work really well. Yeah. You know, we have a number of clues that are really, you know, set up. So you're experiencing, you know, either you're giving back or you're experiencing something a little bit different. Yeah. And, you know, reporting back on that and uh, I think is, is probably the way to go to yeah. get them out of their comfort zone. Because we all, you know, when you go on a Famil and there's the coach and there's the guy with the name and you know, it all just goes along and you get the cocktail and every, everything smoothly works. That's not the reality. The reality is you get out of, out of the plane, you've been down the back, you've flown for 24 hours, you, you walk out, it's minus 20 degrees, you're wearing a T-shirt and you can't find a taxi and you've lost your luggage. That's the reality. Yeah. And that's what a lot of our customers are seeing, but we're not seeing that on for meals. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we need to sort of find something somewhere in between. It's almost, you know, a familiar with six, six agents on it. We should have a lucky dip and make sure at least one person loses their luggage so we can at least go through the process of what it looks like to lose your luggage in Kathmandu Airport or something like that. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, exactly right. And uh, look, you know, obviously moving forward with the business and, and what you guys are working on at the moment, I know you're very... I guess, you know, um, you'd like to set goals and you like to, you know, to know what's next. Um, you know, what are you guys working on at the moment, you know, and how are you going through that process and, and what does that look like for maybe the agents out there that are kind of maybe not knowing what they could, you know, should be doing next or, or what they could be focusing on. What are you, what are you doing right now that's, that's taking you towards where you want it to be? Um, so in our, our leisure space is a little bit of hibernation at the moment. Um, corporate is all about, process improvements, um, just trying to take a step out of every, every single process. Um, study tours where really look, because we're, we're getting to the stage of running 120 study tours, we're starting to need some pretty good automation even in that, in that process. So we're working through um, visiting, looking at the customer journey and uh, from because so, so many of our processes are our own processes. And I've now challenged the teams to actually right, flip it the other way, look at it, what it looks like from the, from the customer and see if there's any gaps. So that, that's, that's something we're working on at, at the um, moment. We're also looking, my feeling is by the time it all comes back, half my team are going to work from wanting to work a percentage of time at home. And so we're going to, we're in a beautiful office, stunning, stunning office, um, fantastic for, you know, meeting clients, great place to work. So we're working on a concept called 
this, the original April Fool's joke, uh, rehome, where we're going to rehome consultants that potentially they might have been running a um, they might have been running an agency and decide look it's too hard to run their own agency right now. They might have two or three consultants. Um, they're maybe in that semi-retirement phase, and um, or the agency they're working for is closed down, but they've got a good look of good book of clients. Now they might have been the traditional ones that would work from home and work as commission consultants, but they've now experienced that for a few months and they've gone, no, that's not for me. I, I'm a people person. I need to be in an office. I need to be meeting people. So the concept will be rehoming consultants in a fantastic environment. Um, so we might end up with this weird thing where the majority of our team are at home and the, the office is actually filled with commission consultants. So that's going to be interesting from a, a, cult, a cultural mix. Um, but what it will do, it will guarantee us some revenue without the expense associated because we've already got the things. We've got the rent, we've got the processes, we've got the systems. So we feel over 30 years, um, it's not just the, the brand and the culture we've created. We do have a lot of really good systems and processes where we just know what to do. So uh, being able to provide that for some of these consultants and a really nice place to work. So that's where what it may look out, look at coming out of this uh, early, early in the new year. And we're looking at rehoming small travel management companies as well, because many of them have these one-off expenses. It might be a dashboard, it could be Chamada, it could be robotics, um, all, these, all these sorts of things where it works well if you've got 10 or 15 or 20 um, in your team. But if you're only a small, small business, add rent to that, you're continuously chasing. So if we can rehome them again in a great professional environment with our systems, templates and processes, do a commission split, they can still run their own brand. So again, we may be looking at rehoming um, corporate businesses as well. So that's that's what we're looking at in the future because we don't see um, it recovering at least for 12 months and our lease is two or three years. So we've got to make the best you know, of the of the of the offers, and uh, yeah, why not use it to create a, a great environment for other people to work in? Yeah. And uh, on a lighter note, have you have you got a bit of travel plan for yourself um, when you can, when the borders open? Um, what are you what are you attempting to to get to, or, or what have you got planned if it if it allows you? Yeah, I've um, I was managed to um, qualify for the New York Marathon which is on the, sorry, not qualified, but I managed to get in. And um, it's really hard. It's really hard to get that golden ticket. And that's on the 1st of November. The reality is um, that's probably not going to happen. Um, I'm really hoping the race is deferred till next year because then I'll still have the ticket to get in. I've got no appetite at all to go to America at the moment. Um, but... I've also booked myself to Queenstown later in November for the Queenstown Marathon as a backup. So realistically, the next trip will be to Queenstown for the marathon. And we also have a trip plan to Svalbard in July next year. We we're planning to do it this year, but there's only 12 kayaks on the ship and we wanted to be in the kayak squad. And so we deferred it this year to next year, which sort of worked out pretty well. And uh, so that's the next, I guess, yeah, big trip is uh, 10 days circumnavigating um, Svalbard and going out kayaking every day. Awesome. How many marathons have you done? Um, four. Wow. Yeah. That's four, four more than I have done and will ever do, which is well done. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you know, three or four years ago, um, I would never have imagined. I only started running, I think, when I was 50. So... Um, yeah, I never imagined I'd be, I never ran more than five kilometres. I never imagined I could run a marathon. And just one by one, you just sort of knock off a 10K and then you try and stretch to a half, half marathon. And on it goes from there. But uh, yeah, last year I was very lucky to get to Berlin for the Berlin Marathon. Wow. And that was the most ex incredible experience. You know, the uh, 40,000 runners, you know, hundreds of thousand people lining the streets. You know, it's incredible. Awesome. Uh, Carson, you've, you've given us a huge amount of value today. And look, we really appreciate you taking the time um, on a public holiday 
down there in, uh, in, in sunny Melbourne. Uh, do, you, do you have any um, people or, or friends that you think would also add some value to the group and would be happy to share their story that you might want to nominate um, for, uh, for one of these Zoom casts? Yeah, I think, um, I think Peter Hosper from the Travel Authority would be uh, pretty good value. Peter, Peter's got a lot of experience and uh, he knows which is a bit of a play on the tagline of his business. And uh, also uh, Richard Van Campen from All the Travel in Perth. He's, uh, he's an industry veteran. He's been around a long time, but uh, he tells a good story. So I think both of those two would uh, really add value. Yeah, great. Well, we'll tag them in the post and uh, see if they can find some time to jump on. And uh, as I said, mate, it's, it's been great. I've got a lot of value out of it uh, myself personally. So I know that everybody else watching um, Will as well. Uh, we wish you all the best uh, with everything in the future and, and what it all looks like on the other side. And um, yeah, look forward to for catching up and, and you know meeting face to face one day, hopefully. Yeah, it'd be good. I'd love to. I had my first smashed avocado for a long time yesterday. So uh, yeah, I'll definitely shout you one uh, when we catch up in, for real. Yeah, sounds good. All right, Carson. Thanks so much for your time, mate. And we'll talk soon. Thanks, Cheers. Bye. Bye.